Hey everyone, welcome to the Difference Maker Revolution podcast and on this week's episode we have four of the five, the four best looking ones I would say, right? The youngest. Four youngest. <laughs> yeah, the youngest. That, yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, definitely three are the youngest, right? And I'm not going to say which three though. Don't pick on Janine all oh, the time. Sorry. God. <laughs> So guys, today I think we're going to talk about turning potential clients or leads into bookings because I'm a bit of a browser and I like browsing Facebook groups. And when I browse Facebook groups, I like to look at all the comments that photographers are commenting with. And they do. Isn't that called a stalker? I was going to say that, but yeah, no, I'm not a stalker. (laughs) I'm a browser. I'm curious. I like okay. information gathering. Right. And it's fascinating. He lurks. He what? I said he, I said he lurks. I lurk. I do lurk. And it's just, it fascinates me some of the, the comments. Like if, if you've some photographers running Facebook ads and they say, yeah, Facebook ads don't really work that well for me because I called the lead and I text the lead and they never respond to me. I much prefer it when the clients find me. But at the same time, these same photographers who complain about client, like a lead not answering one text or one call, don't have enough bookings and complain about not having enough clients in the door. So where's that balance? What's happening, guys? How do we kind of, how do you, Brad and Janine, how do you guys in your business reframe your mindset to know that it's you that has to do the work and put in the effort to actually earn the conversation with your potential clients? Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, we're not photographers. I mean, Janine kind of is. She, she uses a camera and she, she knows how to use a camera. But, you know, she, she had a corporate job before that. And I, I've never been interested in taking photographs. I, I joined the family business for just a year out to <laughs> to be lazy because I was fed up with education. <laughs> I had full intentions of going to university, but never did. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've never had to reframe that. I suppose is my point. I, I never, I never had to reframe that mentality. That mentality was always in me. I'm, I'm sure it was always in Janine. Like you always. You gotta, you gotta go out and get your customers. Your customers aren't gonna come to you. And, and I think, I think, yeah, we talk about reframing it a lot because a lot of our members are photographers. They're photographers who want to earn income through their passion. Um, and when that's the case, there's there's a lot of reframing done because it's not about the art. It's not about how well you photograph. It's not about the products you create in a sense of you know a photographic product. It's it's got far more to do in business and and create a product that that fits a need or solves a problem for an avatar. So I, I've always understood that. Janine's always understood that, um, and my dad's always understood that. He picked a camera up to make. I was money. just going to ask that as my next question to everyone. So, did anyone on this call, Vol Run Studios, did anyone start a studio because they loved photography? What was the reason that you started? A photography business. Steve, you go first. I like photography. I enjoy photography, but I bought it. I'm one of those rare people that bought a studio. So I paid um, a couple of hundred thousand dollars for the privilege of buying what I thought was a business. So you bought a studio because you wanted to get into business yeah janine i I wanted i was looking for a business and it sounded like a fun business to get into okay but i'm i i had to win i had to invest in that so you had an interest in photography but you bought your first photography business because you wanted to get into business i like photography i didn't don't think i had an interest in photography like i do now right so Janine, same question to you. Did you get, how did you first get into photography? Like, was it because you loved it or did you want to create a business from the get go? I always knew I was going to have a business, uh, but I always, my, 
I, cause I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So my route through engineering was always to get my corporate experience and then start like an engineering firm. Right. That was, that was my, my plan through life. Um, when I, what'd you say? That was me in accounting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. when I started enjoying photography, cause I learned it when I was traveling with my corporate job, um, and I realized how much I loved people. I realized that owning an engineering firm probably wasn't the <laughs> best way to enjoy my love of people and run a business. Uh, so I, my love of photography and my love of people is what brought me to that. However, uh, when I was leaving, you know, what they call the golden handcuffs, I didn't have an option. Like I had, like it was, I'm going to start a business and it has to make as much money, if not more than I was making at my corporate job or why why leave? Uh, and so I, I went in right from the get go of I'm starting up a business. It's in photography, not engineering. It's just the different type of business. And it's going to make money. And Brad, you mentioned that your dad picked up a camera to make money. When you joined the family business and you stayed now for what, 10, 11, 12 years, don't know how many years now. But was your goal anything other than to be in business? Like was was that everything? Yeah, no. I, my, my goal was simple. I just, I just wanted wealth. <laughs> That's all I wanted. <laughs> I, I, I figured out how I was going to do it, but uh, but operating the studio, I, 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 that was the easiest way for me to for me to do it. It took, it took me a year to figure it out to, to fathom that. But yeah, it, it's why I stayed. I like business. I like solving problems. And I liked operating a profitable business. And I liked investing the money from said profitable business. So I, I love that. I don't, you know, and ultimately I don't, I just don't love operating a photographic studio. I'm not in love with photography. I'm not in love with a photographic business. I'm in love with business in general and just solving problems and investing. That, that's where my real passion lies. So I know this started as something different, but I've taken it this route because it just it kind of clicked there, there and then. It's kind of like, I feel like most photographers that we speak to fall in love with photography and fall in love with, you know, taking pretty pictures and then want to discover how to not have to work so they can continue to take photographs and get paid for that. So I feel like, you can still love photography. I love photography. I, I didn't go in with the intention of loving photography. Yeah. But um, I, I love I love that part. I love the fact that um, photography can create um, such a difference in somebody's life, and it's a tool. Um, but you can still love photography and um, have an incredible business. Oh, hundred percent. I guess my point is that kind of when you first get into it, your mindset's maybe a little bit different. And maybe that's why you three guys, when you have run your business, you know, you've always had that attitude and belief that, you know, I have to deliver an amazing service. I have to deliver a five-star experience. I have to prospect and do the work to, you know, create those great clients and to follow up with my potential clients and leads. Whereas maybe someone who's coming in who hasn't been exposed to that yet, hasn't realized that they just are expecting people to fall into their studio or their business. Potentially. Just an interesting observation. I think the, con the concept is out there that, you know, if you, take a better photo, um, you'll get more clients. And it's a this is why we're building the revolution because it seems to be a message that's um, spread amongst the industry. But in reality, you actually have to go and find clients because most people don't even realise that they this is something that they want until it, they're given the opportunity to do that. You know, it's... it's it's like my favorite quote from one of my favorite films, you know, uh, Muppets from Space, where, where Gonzo is played with visions um, from, um, you know, and he wants to find longing and, and find out where, where he fits in the universe and in the world. And, um, uh, and, and Pepe Le Pron, is it Pepe Le Pron? No, it's, it's Pepe Le Pron. What's the shrimp called? 
No, it's not Pepe Le Pew. It is, it is the, the shrimp and Rizzo. Anyway, the, the shrimp and Rizzo confuse Gonzo into building a, building a jacuzzi and then they will come. You know, if you build a jacuzzi, they will come. And he builds said jacuzzi and nobody comes. You know, his, his, his alien ancestors don't come down. It was just a ruse by Rizzo to be able to sit in this hot tub and have a wonderful time. And, and I think that's what a lot of photographers do. I, th I think they've been sold it. I think they've been missold that dream by a lot of educators because educators are, you know, like Rizzo and, and the shrimp, they want a hot tub. The hot tub being they want photographers to believe it's all about the artwork because then they can sell you courses about photographing really, really nicely. Uh, so you buy that course, but then you're not actually going to get any clients from it because it's not actually about the jacuzzi. It's not about the artwork. It's about the difference you make in somebody's life. It's about it, problems you solve for people. It's about marketing. It's about, it's about being proactive in your business. Whereas a lot of people like to just think they can just build that jacuzzi uh, and they're going to get all the clients, and uh, it's a lie. And it's a lie that's perpetuated because all those photographers, or the vast majority of those photographers, who sell those courses where you can travel around the world and photograph and uh, all that wonderful stuff, most of them don't have a business. And they don't have a business, so to earn income, they have to sell their photographic skills in teaching other photographers how to photograph so they can make money. And, and that's just like the never-ending cycle of, how to make money with art because you can't actually go out and do it to clients because you lack those business skills but you can sell it to photographers because they believe that lie they believe the lie that if they build a jacuzzi the aliens will come and they don't wow <laughs> they came from you can, you can, it's also that feel the dreams okay, you know they came from Kevin you know, but but Muppets in Space way better film <laughs> I could use a jacuzzi right now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I think to Jonathan's point, it is that question of how you get into the business and the mindset you have from the get-go. I think it really does affect a lot of what you expect. And I think so many artists expect to struggle. And so they kind of self-fulfill that prophecy of expecting to struggle because if I'm amazing, like I remember when I, uh, my cousin's a photographer and he's an artist and he's amazing and he's incredible. And he came at it from a photojournalistic standpoint, right? He was a photojournalist for a long time before going into portraiture. Um, and we had this debate back when we were in our twenties about, should you charge for your art? I'm like, uh, yeah, like, why wouldn't I? <laughs> if I didn't, I would just stay as an engineer, you know? Um, but it is interesting on that. I think so many people have it like if, um, they have a hard time with this concept and they expect to struggle and they, they just, it just fulfills in their mind. Um, and they, and we've talked about confirmation bias and they get online and they see other people and they see other uh, photographers who aren't getting paid what they deserve and they confirm their own bias. That's what's going to happen. And so I think it's very interesting in that regards as well. Well, I think it comes back as well, Janine, to what you said the other day in one of our daily meetings you were talking about this idea that I feel like sometimes people don't want to work and you yeah. we were talking about doing something like talk about different crazy ideas like not crazy ideas but being like a, a studio takeover fired for a month so Steve was talking about or a case study a day in the life of Janine and you know when we were, and when we were, uh, in the day of the life of Brad and when we we're discussing that you were saying like people might be shocked if they saw a day in the life of Janine yeah, it's a lot of work being me. It's a lot of work being Brad. <laughs> I know we make it look so easy and sexy, uh, but you know we get up early and we work our butts off all day long to to do what we do. And we're working two jobs. My Brad has three. He does his property too. You know, I mean, we're running our studios. We're doing the Difference Maker Revolution. We're recording podcasts. We're recording education. We're helping all of the members, and so we're doing all of that to help photographers. And we're also running our own studios as well. So, and that's why I, you know, it's funny. I think as uh, it's that whole mom and me too, I, I have little pity for people who are not willing to work. And I, I do that with my kids too. I'm like, no, you will work for what you're gonna get. You know, I'm not gonna help you do your homework. You're gonna do it. It's your grade, not mine. I already went to school, you know? <laughs> and so it's because you see so many people who do things for others and do it for them. And then they don't learn how to do it on their own. They don't get that work ethic. And, uh, and so, but it is, it's hard work. It's not easy. And of course it'd be easier if the phone just rang and people just wanted us. 
uh, and people wanted to hire our services, but that just doesn't happen. And I think that's what I had said in that meeting, which is what you're thinking. Like work just doesn't fall from the sky. It's not like Jesus sending down manna from the heavens. You know, it's not, it's not just there. You have to do something to get it. And I think a lot of photographers get trapped in this mentality of if my work is amazing, people will book me. That's all I have to do is perfect my art, perfect my photography, make it so amazing that people will just want to book me. And that's just not the way it and is. And there's two quotes, Janine, that recently popped up. Um, that recently popped up in my timeline. And I'm going to go to one of them first. But you mentioned that, you know, you guys sometimes make it seem effortless that you're running a business. You make it seem effortless because people don't see what happens behind the scenes. They only see the end result, right? And there was a very famous tennis player that people should know because he's one of the most famous of all time and one of the greatest of all time. And he was awarded a doctorate for in Dartmouth or University in the US. Anyway, he was given his commencement speech or whatever it was. And this particular player was known for being effortless. Like when you watched him play, it just looked like he glided across the court. Everything looked so easy, so simple. It looked like he wasn't trying. And he said in his commencement speech last week, he said, effortless is a myth. People would say my play was effortless. They meant it as a compliment, but it used to frustrate me. The truth is I had to work very hard to make it look easy. It's not about having a gift. It's about having grit. <laughs> I think that's so many, so that's ties into this. Gonzo story, you know, build or feel the dreams or whatever you want to call it, Muppets in Space of build it, they will come. But the reality is like you're putting in the work to build it in the background and people aren't seeing that. No, I think you're right. And people don't see that. It's the, um, you know, it took me 20 years to get lucky type thing. You hear that from people who are envisioned as overnight successes and no one sees the work that goes in. I saw a really good documentary, Ed Sheeran, uh, talked about this, you know, and I thought it was an amazing documentary because he goes into that, like everyone just sees that all of a sudden he became this international sensation. But until you watch the documentary, you don't know, like from the age of like 10 to 11, he was at pubs when his friends were out playing, he was like playing, playing. He was at a pub playing a guitar in front of nobody. <laughs> And he's like, you know, if I'm going to get a following, if I, I'm going to go every night, regardless of nobody being there or little people being there. And because I want to get better and I want to improve and I'm going to build a following and learn how to write music and learn how to play and learn how to sing and learn how to entertain. And he did it like every night of the week while his friends were out playing and being teenagers. He was working and learning his craft and perfecting it and learning how to write. And so like it looks like he's an overnight success and lucky he got discovered one night but it's because he was at that night every night for like eight years <laughs> you know and so he works harder than anybody and if you like you you see what he does to put into his recordings and his songwriting and um and everything and you realize the effort that's put in is not just easy it doesn't just come he doesn't just happen to have hit songs you know and so but yeah you everyone just sees the success and assumes it just happened and it was just lucky or they were in the right place at the right time. Well, they were for a reason because they were there a lot. <laughs> so as we're lurking in these forums, Steve, and we're seeing photographers uh, comment about they're running ads, they're generating potential clients and leads and that they have to, you know, they're saying they're calling them once, texting them once, and you know, they're not answering. So they're giving up. So they're blaming those leads and saying, oh, you know, this, they, they don't value me. They don't work. What, what do you say to those people? Well, who, you know, you see a strange number. Who picks up the phone these days? Like everybody's screening their calls. Um, and, you know, I, I do it. <laughs> Everybody does it. But I think um, like looking, you know, coaching people and when you look at the statistics, um, a lot of the times they're call people are calling once and it, it takes more than one phone call to get a hold of even a, even a friend. Like I call my brother sometimes, it takes six calls to get a hold of him. Um, but, you know, you don't give up on them. And I think people are giving up too quickly. And 
you know, because I'm coaching people, I get to listen to their messages. And a lot of the times we're promising people we're going to call them the next day or that night. And it might be three days before people are calling back. And so then it sort of builds, we're not keeping our promises. So it doesn't build any trust. Um, it's incredible. Like we were on a call the other night and um, it just, there were, there were a couple of people that just had this incredible energy about them and they had no problem, it seems, <laughs> getting bookings and getting people to spend. And I think people borrow your confidence, people borrow your energy and you've got to give that out um, because people are attracted by your confidence and by your energy. And if your um, assumption is that people aren't going to pick up the phone or they're not going to book or they're not going to want to talk to you, it's that self-fulfilling prophecy that even if you do get them on the phone, um, they're not getting the bookings. Um, but it, it was like when people radiate, they seem to attract the bookings. So, Brad, hey, we all know Facebook ads don't work anymore, right? So how do you keep you and your team motivated to turn those potential clients into bookings and great clients? Like, like my managerial style, my, my leadership style, is um, I'm very I'm very akin to, to actually a hero of mine. I've got him on, on my wall just over there, um, Marshall, uh, Marshall Michel Ney of, of, the, um, of the French Empire. Um, uh, it was a man that, that would either bully you or inspire you to greatness. Um, and, and that was my management style. Um, when we were running the studio, when we were growing the studio, that was very much the style I had um, because, because that was the only style that got results. I was working in a business with my parents and, and my girlfriend at the time, my now wife. Um, the lines are very blurred. <laughs> <laughs> incredibly blurred uh, and the only way I could keep people motivated was to essentially um, watch them do the job and and that that was kind of I was like the maitre d as, as Steve would call it in the studio I was making sure that all the sessions ran on time I was I was making sure the clients were parked in, in, in the car park okay but I was making sure that every spare moment we had we were on the phone so, so any nonsense jobs, so I, I, I created two lists. There were important jobs and nonsense jobs. A nonsense job that was anything that was not moving towards creating a booking, delivering to a client or making a sale, um, that, that was a priority job. And at the time, my mum would be booking boudoirs in. I'd be, I, I was booking other things in as well, but a lot of the times all those boudoirs needed a phone call from my mother. I'd, I'd just grab it whenever I could. And, and get on the phone and, and if I was running ads and we weren't getting a return on it, I'd make time to make those phone calls for the team. I was, I was managing my calendar and their calendars to make sure it happened. Um, because just, just, you know, just thinking it's going to happen or thinking you're going to get around to it, it just doesn't work. Or that it didn't work in, in my experience. I had to make sure the job got done. Um, so I always made sure the job got done. Um, and I think being a solo solopreneur, I think that that's hard because all that pressure's on you. So you need to you need to have discipline, and and discipline's discipline's difficult, um, uh, and you have to you have to do new things to find better discipline. Uh, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but I'm I'm intermittent fasting. I, I've been intermittent fasting and fasting in general for for probably a couple of months now. I like it. Um, I, I like the discipline. I like the daily wins. I suppose, I suppose that's the main thing behind discipline is if, when you're disciplined to do a job, you feel like you've been successful and you can take something off. So a lot of the times, if you have a bookings target, you have to be disciplined to hit that bookings target. You have to be disciplined to pick up the phone and phone your leads and get your clients in because if you don't, you, your business isn't going to move forward. And, and, making, and, and having time for calls doesn't just happen. Yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah, you have to make time. 
and and I've <laughs> had many 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 arguments uh, with with my wife and mother when when they've gotten home from work and it's six o'clock. It's been a long day. It might be seven o'clock. And it's been a long day, and I'm waiting for them with a the phone, the mobile phone, at the diary, and a, a, a huge stack of leads. I'm like, you can't do anything until you phone these. I'll sit with you. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna go go off and do something else. Slightly, like, but you have to phone these now because if you don't phone them, we're not gonna get return on the marketing I've spent. We need to do the work. And I suppose it's similar to what Janine says. You don't see what goes behind closed doors. You don't see just the sheer amount of work that goes into it. You know, but my my parents and, and myself and Ruth, it's like eight while eight. So it's it, or, or for me, it was more like ten a.m. to eight p.m. Um, I was never as, as good as an early riser as my parents were, but they were always in the studio at 8 a.m. and they'd be leaving at 8 p.m. That was every day. But do you find it so amazing how nonsense work, <laughs> you call I love that, <laughs> nonsense, <laughs> nonsense work um, can s suck up a whole day? Um, oh, massively. <laughs> massively. And, and you don't know. You're procrastinating and you don't know you're procrastinating. Yeah, you're not doing it's, your business. And a lot of the time, those nonsense jobs are the jobs that people really like. Mm. It could be data entry. I know a lot of people who love data entry, you know? Like, uh, it, 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 I, 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 I used to do all our, all our data entry. I used to be really upset if I'd missed a couple of weeks. But if I'd not put the data in, if I'd missed it because I was doing my important jobs. But I really mm. loved that job. But I, I have to not do it. Like Ruth loves editing. It pained her so much to give that job up. Like that, that was a pain for her to let that job go because she loved it. I, I know a lot of photographers feel the same because they love the job. They enjoy the job. But if you want to earn an income from it, you, you kind of have to give that up. Or keep it, set yourself some deadlines and, and make sure yeah. that you're setting the time aside that you need in order to get the clients to have the editing to do. So be honest, Brad, which one's um, easier to work with, your girlfriend or your wife? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, definitely my girlfriend. Yeah, no, yeah, it's one person, but yeah, definitely girlfriend. You know, now, now you know, I've got a ring on my finger it's, it's it's slightly more permanent <laughs> now that I have a ring and God's involved. It's it's become a much more permanent thing. <laughs> so it's you know I suppose it has changed how I operate in the business. Like I can't operate that that style now. That my old managerial style I can't. I really struggle to go back to. Um, since, since being married, I can't. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. I can't be. I can't manage my wife. I struggle managing my wife. I could manage my girlfriend like hell. Like, <laughs> like hell. But, but now I can't. I feel bad. <laughs> so, lucky, lucky she loves you lots. And she loves yeah, she does. I love really her lots. It's probably why I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so, going back to turning potential clients into, or turning leads into bookings and clients. And... I mean, we talked about mindset and I brought up the mindset a lot because I feel like that's the foundation to it. If you don't have the mindset that you have to actually put in some effort, then you're going to fail, right? You have to know what you have to do, right? And you have to have the right approach to things. So why do you think, because I, I joked about Facebook ads not working earlier. You know, it does take that in, that was in jest. I hope you could tell by my tonality. But Brad, you've said to me a couple of days ago, they're working better than ever before and ads are easier than ever before. So why do you think people struggle with this idea that Facebook ads don't work? What, what is it? What's different about them? Oh, uh, well, uh, I, we kind of touched on it really earlier. Uh, it, it tends, it, it, all, a lot of it's mindset. Uh, and a lot of it's like, if you've never, if you've never run a business, and now you're kind of running a business and you want to test an ad and the ad doesn't go well. It's really hard to know what your expectations are or what to expect. Like prospecting's hard. 
Steve bought a business that was already prospecting. He had to get in there. I went into a business that was already prospecting, that was already actively marketing, phoning people, getting clients, delivering. When you're starting out yourself, that's a completely new skill set you have to learn. Um, and without the right expectation, then, then you can run an ad, get 10 leads, book one person and think it's been terrible. But, you know, if, if you if it costs you a hundred pound or a hundred dollars to book that one person in and you sold them $1,500 or a thousand dollars, but like it's worth it, you know, like th th all you got to do then is make that repeatable and make it consistent because all, all business is, if you want to get a six figure plus business, all that is, is having a marketing system, a sales system, a product delivery system that you do consistently or you can do consistently. And most photographers can, can do the photography part and some of them can do the sales part, but they can't do the marketing part. And I suppose that marketing part's always been the, the hardest problem to solve in the sense that, that you love photography, so that, 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 that's a bit of a tick. If you photograph, you have to sell, so, so, so that always happens next. But most photographers never market. So, so marketing's a brand new thing for the vast majority of people starting a business out. Because you can pick a camera up and, and photograph and sell to somebody straight away. You can do that with friends and family. That's easy. And you're going to run out of friends and family at, at some point. At some point, you actually have to go out and market. Um, so, so marketing is a, is a hard-to-learn skill set, but one that is required. Well, especially if you want some consistency. and Because I feel like you know some people who... I, I've spoken to many photographers who have you know, great average sale. You know, decent four figure average sale. They've had 10K sales and they tell me that, you know, they don't have enough clients. And one of the reasons why is that they're afraid to market almost because the clients that they do have, like it's a roller coaster seesaw where, you know, some weeks they might have two or three clients. That's all they want. And then other weeks they might have zero because they have no consistent marketing system. But those clients that they do have, you know, are either referrals or they find them through a Google search and SEO. Mm -hmm. So they're actively looking for, you know, photography or what they have to offer. So it's easier, their conversion rate of, of converting that person from an inquiry or a lead into a booking is super high because that person that's searching is already searching for a solution to something. Whereas with, you know, if you run a Facebook ad or you go to an, an expo, then the potential clients or leads you get gathered there, you have to put in a little bit more work. So your conversion rates can be lower, you know, because not, they're not actively searching for it. You're creating that great client. So I think that that mindset and that understanding of marketing probably plays a role too. I think uh, when you said um, that, you know, people are looking, um, already looking for photography, those tend to be the people that have put in five or six inquiries though too, to different photographers. Um, whereas a lot of the times if you're the person in their face or you're the person that's advertised for them, um, you're the only one of very few people on their radar um, and they're making a spontaneous decision based on um, that rapport that you're building and, and whether you can find what they're truly after. I think sometimes, um, you know, when people are looking for a photographer, you still have to do some work. You still have to do the work because a lot of the times they're... they're they've sent three or four inquiries so you can't sit on it and think oh they're going to book and get back to it next week or the week after because in the meantime they've probably spoken to somebody else so they have to book they have to be onto it as well probably easier but still there's some level of work to be done too oh yeah you can't rest in your laurels you still it's still speed to lead that wins and the experience right referrals different though if somebody's being directly referred to you as you've got to go to this person they're the best you know they're the best, then, you know, that's a much easier person to convert. Easier to convert, but you still got to put in work, right? Yeah. You got to make an effort because that person wants, wants to believe that, um, you know, they're seen and they're wanted and 
that they and that they're valued as a customer. So I'm going to come to you guys for your biggest takeaways, but I think my biggest takeaway from this podcast has been that if you want to build an actual business, you have to put in some work that's not just going to magically happen. That's my biggest takeaway. What's yours, Brad? Um, that, that, um, uh, I suppose it was, uh, I was listening to a podcast between a friend of mine and then, then another business mentor I listened to, um, a guy called James Sinclair and Simon Kidd. And I was watching the podcast they were on. Um, uh, and, and James Sinclair was complimenting Siam because he said that in his opinion, all the best entrepreneurs are really great marketeers. Um, and I, I think that's just the case. I think the best entrepreneurs, the best people who run really great photographic studios are also very talented marketeers. Um, because without marketing, without the ability and skill set to go prospect and get clients, you, you're just, you're never going to have consistency and you'll never be able to grow to where you want to grow. So it's a skill set you, you have to learn. What about you, Steve? What's your biggest takeaway? I love I loved um, what you shared about the tennis player making it look effortless and how much work it takes to make it look effortless. And I think a lot um, in any business, um, people put a lot of effort in and there's a lot of skill to get to where they are and photographers are no exception. They, there is a lot of work that goes into making taking a photo look effortless, but we also need to put the same level of effort and determination um, and willingness to fail um, into marketing and into getting people in. Um, and if we had the same determination um, to make that part of it effortless, everybody would have an incredible business. Absolutely. So when you're ready to make your business look effortless, like Brad and Janine do every single day, the best place for you to learn how to do that is inside the inner circle. So inside the inner circle, you're going to learn the marketing, sales, you know, financial systems and skills that you need to actually build a sustainable, profitable photography business. So just click on the link below to apply today. And when you apply and you're accepted and the fireworks go off, they're not going off on this podcast, uh -oh, then uh, that is the first step you need to take to transforming your business. So that's it for this podcast. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you later.